L'appuntamento a cui state per partecipare è il primo degli incontri di Privacy for Futures. In risposta a un panorama normativo che è sempre più complesso, a rapide interruzioni tecnologiche e all'assenza di approcci strategici e prospettici alla privacy, Privacy for Future rappresenta un cambiamento fondamentale verso l'apprendimento e lo sviluppo anticipatori nella gestione della privacy. Con l'obiettivo di potenziare i professionisti della privacy e della protezione dei dati, Privacy for Future offre intuizioni preziose sulle metodologie di previsione, dotandoli di strumenti avanzati per navigare e affrontare le sfide emergenti nel dominio in continua evoluzione della privacy. Privacy for Future è una piattaforma di apprendimento interattivo che favorisce un ambiente dinamico in cui i pari si impegnano e imparano gli uni dagli altri, guidati da un focus sulla comprensione, la condivisione e l'anticipazione, rispondendo alle esigenze di evoluzione dell'ecosistema della privacy. Privacy for Future è il risultato di un impegno collaborativo tra tre entità altamente qualificate nel panorama italiano e internazionale. 42 Law Firm e eh, P4i offrono competenze di alto livello e una rete di contatti significativa, mentre Longviews eh, assicura la solidità delle metodologie e dei processi nel campo del foresight e del pensiero futuro. Se volete essere parte di questa nuova avventura, trovate più informazioni a www.privacyforfuture.it. Iniziamo! Ok, let's start. Let's start. <laughs> Ciao Max. Hey there. Thank you so much for being here today. And uh, for the people looking at the stream, we are live. It's uh, uh, um, 11 and 37 minutes and uh, unfortunately right now uh, the um, uh, our appointment will be held uh, in uh, English language well on my part what what I call English is something similar <laughs> something uh, with the here. Super Mario uh, <laughs> accent but d don't worry as you may 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 know Max is quite uh, an important person, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> You're not sure. Uh, for those, for for the few of you that do not understand, uh, that do not know uh, exactly Max Schrems, who is Max Schrems, uh, I will take just a description from uh, uh, Wikipedia that says uh, an Australian activist, lawyer, and author who became known for campaigns against Facebook for its privacy violations including violation of the European privacy laws and alleged <laughs> transfer of personal data to the National Security Agency, the NSA, as part of the NSA's PRISM program. Shams uh, is the founder of NOIB, a European Center of uh, Digital Rights. NOIB is uh, the largest no-profit, I think, right now, dealing with... Uh, international issues about data transfer and all the part of data. Yeah, I think especially for litigation, we're probably the biggest one. There is a lot of other NGOs that do more policy work and, and lobbying and all that kind of stuff, but actual litigation in that sense, we're, we're probably the ones that really do that. Okay, so uh, I asked you to come here, thanks to, uh, to Privacy for Future, just to talk about the hot topic for most professionals here in Europe. And the hot topic is data transfer. Not because it's the, well, I don't think it's, uh, technically speaking, the most important one on uh, usage of data. Mm. I think it's the one that has uh, the largest impact on uh, on businesses all, yeah. around, uh, all around Europe right now. It's, let's say, one of the topics that if you do paper compliance pops up quicker than other topics, let's do it that way. Um, but even for us, it's probably 5% of our work. Um, like we do much other topics as well, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I've prepared a couple of uh, uh, questions, but since uh, I needed intelligent questions, I <laughs> couldn't be providing that uh, uh, myself. <laughs> and so I asked a couple of colleagues uh, in uh, Privacy for Future to write them down. Anna Cataleta, you, you met her, Anna, yeah. a couple of minutes ago, that is senior partner of P4I uh, and its co-founder of Privacy for Future. Over the years, uh, and also before your activism, <laughs> well, mainly before, because your activism on the matter, data transfer practices have been challenged. This has led uh, to revision and updates of these practices in the context, uh, uh, oops, sorry, uh, 
in the context, have you observed a substantial improvement in safeguards <laughs> for the individuals <laughs> involved, or are we still at the same point uh, when we were before Schrems uh, one? Um, <laughs> good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the, the biggest problem here, and, and that probably speaks to a very big issue in privacy in general, is we do have now two decisions by the Court of Justice um, that kind of say what you should do. Um, but then we realized that in practice that's hardly done. Um, so we do see, I think, that people got a bit more like. It's the worried. most polite way yeah. of describing <laughs> I've ever seen <laughs> from you. <laughs> um, and uh, usually the, the, the problem that we see, I think, is, is really like a rule of law issue in that area that we do have a fundamental right. We do have, you know, the Court of Justice even says that's, that's a violation of the essence of your fundamental right. And then the industry just continues doing it anyways. And to a large extent, what we really have is a big enforcement problem in the whole privacy bubble. Um, and that really plays out here. I mean, for the data transfers, um, it's probably not necessarily always the biggest privacy violation for the average show. It is, however, a big issue for, let's say, people that are journalists, activists, politicians, decision makers in big companies, because that is typically people where the NSA is interested in what you're doing. Um, a lot of the surveillance laws that we have are geared towards how can we spy on Europe, the rest of the world. Um, and it's interesting also from a, let's say, political view, um, that we're not more worried about our data going to the U.S. not being protected there. Um, and for me, it's interesting because in the U.S. that became suddenly a big issue once China got their data, then suddenly they were over worried about it or we discuss everything with TikTok. Um, but if you realize that, I don't know, your LinkedIn data or your uh, Facebook or Instagram data goes to the U.S. or most of your Google Mail or whatever you use um, or Microsoft, that usually is much more interesting data than what's on on TikTok. Um, in reality, and and that is available to to the NSA. Um, so for us, it was really a, um, an interesting situation as the question um, says. So like we know these rules exist; they have a purpose actually, but they're largely ignored. And it's a bit like uh, oftentimes say like privacy is oftentimes like a situation where uh, people just build huge houses in a nature protection area where you shouldn't be allowed to build anything, and now you're sitting okay. there like. You would actually have to wreck this whole house now, and no one wants to do that. And and the re the legislator or the the executive doesn't really want to say, guys, you did that. And Please destroy uh, that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's a bit the problem. Like we really, I mean, ever since the '90s, these laws exist, um, but also ever since the '90s, we ignore them. And so we built a whole like technical infrastructure that is largely not compliant with the law to a certain extent. My hope to to probably also get into a solution here. Um, is first of all, the easiest way would be that the US would grant proper protections to foreigners as well. Because the interesting thing on, on the mass surveillance part is that we actually agree in Europe and in the US that this type of surveillance is unconstitutional. Like under the Fourth Amendment to the US Constitution, the NSA surveillance is, is not allowed, um, as long as done on Americans. And the big problem here is that they basically say, as long as it's done on foreigners, we can do what the fuck or what we want because we're partners, but no rights for partners. That's kind of the, the interesting thing. So once we would have a common set of rules and kind of a no spy agreement or some agreement between the US and, and the European Union um, or among, let's say, democratic countries to say there's a certain baseline, you need to have probable cause, you need to have a judge approving it, all these things that we actually have in all these countries also when data transfers across borders, which is even an issue in, in, in Europe. Like as an Austrian, I don't have protections in Germany, which is stupid. Yeah. Um, so I think that is something we need to fix. Once we would fix that, the data transfer issues would be much easier. As long as that's not done, I think the reality for the next probably decade or two is that we'll have kind of geographic regions when it comes to data in general or online laws in general, because um, we now talk about privacy, but if you think about, like, let's say, freedom of speech, there's a different view of freedom of speech in China. Then there's one in Europe that may say, for example, the denial of the Holocaust is a crime in Austria, which yep. the Americans think is free freedom of speech. So there is these different realities. And as long as we have democracies and different cultures, we will have different rules. And that will mean you have to apply software differently and, 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 and comply with different laws. So I think in the, in the short term, we'll, or in the next probably decade or two, we'll probably have to localize much more, even though I'm not a big proponent of that or a big fan of it. But the reality is, if we want to comply with the laws locally, we'll have to adapt systems that way. Um, in the long term, I think what, what would be good is for topics, especially like pri government surveillance, where we have very similar views, 
it would be actually quite cool to have international agreements among the democratic countries um, to make sure that these frictions are not existent anymore. That would be my, let's say, medium term hope, but that requires politics like that requires especially the US government or the US politicians to realize that that's useful for them. And the way to do that is to say, guys, you're making shitloads of money with international customers. Uh, once you have these international customer data, they also deserve some protection because right now the US is ha having this proposition to say, give us all the data, we're the cloud provider of the whole world. But once the data is here, you actually have no rights. Yeah. And I joke a bit, it's like, it's like Switzerland saying, give us all your gold, we host it. But actually, once the gold in Switzerland, you don't have property rights as a foreigner. <laughs> like, no one the fuck would, give, would, would, would buy that bargain. And I think in the long run, the US will have to realize that as well because customers will simply say, okay, that is not a good deal. Um, and I also think that certain, you know, edge cases where they probably had some technology that was a bit more edgy than, than, than a European provider, that also goes away. Like a lot of that became standard. You can buy it everywhere else as well. So that may also be a factor that, that this um, could also change a bit. Yeah. And, and we, we tend as a European to say bad things about Europe uh, normally. We do like uh, our sovereignty. So Europe is seen mm. as, or more often than not, uh, mm. Europe is seen as something hindering our uh, national power. But mm. in this point of view, being part uh, of uh, a loosely coordinated mm. uh, part of the world would be much mm. easier even even for uh, uh, for foreigners uh, and for, for foreign companies like mm. uh, Google Meta etc because it's uh, complying not to every single country's law but yeah. most of the time uh, complying mm. with some transnational uh, yeah. uh, accord. Uh, um. And with a lot of that, I mean, first of all, we have the rules that are European wide now, but a lot of that is actually becoming more global in the sense of like Convention 108 ever since the 1980s yeah. has actually foreseen privacy protections. And even if you look at the US, I mean, they're not having exactly the same law, but Mexico has some kind of yeah. privacy law. Canada has some kind of privacy law. So it's oftentimes, I think, in the, in the national Brazil. discussion. Yeah, Brazil, and I mean, a lot of them have like, let's say, a 108 yeah. um, somewhat compliant thing, and that's going to grow at a certain extent. So I think even that if you look at it globally among the, let's say, Western countries, at least, um, you see that the US becomes more and more isolated as this one country not having that. So I think that is that is actually interesting on the commercial side that even there, I think even there's a majority in the US, the reality is just in the US political system, you can't get anything done anymore. <laughs> Probably otherwise you would have a privacy law by now as well. Yeah. Um, so that, that may also happen. What's really interesting on the government surveillance side, usually Europe even allows more than the US. Like the US is terrified of the government. They're not like, if you look at it, Austria has, I think about as many wiretaps a year than the whole US federal government has. Like we are actually much more permissive here, just that we have developed towards the system of human rights that apply to every human. So if you're Chinese, you also have the same rights in Europe. Um, while the US is still historically under their constitution that's just um, a couple of hundred years older, um, still following the citizens' rights approach. And that conflicts on the internet because you always have people that are not citizens in your country. And, and, and I think that is one of these historic reasons why, why we have this problem. Um, but I think it's gradually gonna, gonna be resolved. In this case, I mean, we're right now preparing Schrems 3. We're just going to go to the Court of Justice another time. The Court of Justice will probably tell everybody the same thing again that they told before. So it's a bit of like a lot of energy waste that is happening here um, for everybody involved, also the companies that now have to deal with this. Um, but for us, it's a bit hard to also have the European Commission just ignore the Court of Justice over and over cool. again, which is a um, becoming for me even more than a privacy topic becomes a... Um, rule of law issue yeah. if if the commission usually tells everybody in the European Union you have to abide the, the rule of law it's important blah 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 European law but once it actually comes to the commission <laughs> accepting other countries then politics is more important than law and um, so I think that is that is also going to be a factor that is interesting because um, the judges in both of the hearings that we had were actually very strong on the on the point that they said we are now a constitutional court after the Lisbon Treaty if the commission goes too far in their political decisions, it's our role to stop it. While the commission was a bit like, oh, that's political, just don't get involved. <laughs> and, um, and I was interested because I think um, it's also gonna be a matter of the authority of the court. If the court already told the commission twice, you can't do this, and they're doing it again and again. It's a bit like, you know, if your parent and your kid is doing the same thing the third time that you told it not to yeah. do, you're probably escalating the situation and you're not holding back. So that may be a situation here as well that, that we'll see. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the United States uh, 
stands on that uh, remembers closely for us Italian Civis Romanus Sum. Uh, I'm a citizen of the Roman Empire, so yeah. I need I have different rights than yeah, everyone yeah. else. And and that's I mean once you have a beard that usually comes up quite. I mean I was an exchange in the U.S. and I love the U.S. on on many ways, but this idea of of we are more special than the others is a reality like that's also what everybody tells you after at least having a drink maybe not before <laughs> but after having a drink they they literally tell you you know we're not going to have rights for foreigners because as a politician in the u.s if i grant rights to foreigners i get kicked out yeah of course if i grant rights um, or remove rights from foreigners i i get votes um, i mean something that is not unknown to us either <laughs> yeah. um but but that's a bit of the reality that we have here so i think the way the the theory of change as you call it that way would be that the u.s industry has a problem to even sell their products in Europe anymore, which would require enforcement and require European customers to say, I'm not buying this anymore. Um, that would generate enough pressure within the US to say, guys, your laws are actually hurting our international business. Yeah. And, and that could be a theory of change where this could actually happen. I don't think that if the commission knocks on the door that that mm, would help no. anything. No. Next question. <laughs> Giuseppe Lacciago, partner in, uh, in uh, 42 Law Firm and co-founder of Privacy for Future. Data is seen by many as uh, the necessary fuel of our dig digital society, that is. is. Uh, uh, this plays tremendous strategic value on data sharing and data transfer. In the light of this, what balance do you perceive between geopolitical consideration and the legislative goal of protecting the rights uh, uh, mm -hmm. and freedom of data subject in the di decisions made by the European Court of Justice concerning data transfer to between the hmm. United States? Um, yeah, that's actually quite an interesting question. So uh, we usually, with most of the litigation we do, we also add, this is how you can do it right. So we're also, myself, I'm like the person that, you know, started programming and loves computers and took it apart when I was a kid already. So I think it's interesting because um, I don't see privacy versus um, like data processing necessarily as a, as a conflict. I see more of it doing it well. It's kind of like, you know, it's it's not like organic farming is against farming. It's like doing farming maybe in a, in a more intelligent way, so mm. to say, if you believe in that. Um, so that is a bit how I see privacy in general. So I think um, if, if software is done well or if products are done well, they would usually, you know, sell better as well or in the long term be probably um, more, more sustainable. And then there's just a limit on, on how far you can go. Same thing in consumer rights. You can obviously have to, the most crazy terms and that may be good for business, <laughs> um, but there's a limit of what we accept in, in consumer rights as well. So I think that's a bit the, the, the dimensions I think in. Uh, on the data transfer specifically, I personally would be a big fan. I'm a globalist personally. <laughs> so I would be a big fan if we would have one pool of, let's say, democratic countries that agree on certain standards and we could have a free flow of data. That is personally what I think is, is the solution. Um, but that requires politicians. So for us, that's really being be it business advisors or privacy people really hard to achieve because that would require basically an act of Congress in the US and that is hard for us to do. <laughs> um, well, not only that, it would be very difficult to, to approach uh, from for many politicians that uh, rely on uh, being uh, over nationalists uh, and so it's, it's a yeah. difficult stance to yeah. take uh, even uh, and for me even politically it's hard in the sense like I'm I, I hate the nationalism that is growing right now and at the same time, you're used to say, oh, we need to like nationalize everything. And I mean, there is a certain argument to, to have, you know, core services run under your jurisdiction where you can also make sure that it's really compliant and you can actually check it. Um, but I would ideally favor a system where we can trust each other enough to not have everything on our own soil, but trust enough that someone else does, does stuff well as well. But we're not there yet. So it's a bit like, you know, a chicken and egg issue. Um, and I think there is, I mean, also some geopolitical changes that we simply have that we also have to consider. Um, one like totally technical approach that was interesting that some at some conference someone raised was like, you know, now where they're blowing up gas pipelines, after all, we're connected to the U.S. with like 10 cables or 20 cables or so. Super easy to just cap off. If your data is on the other side, it's not even about the U.S. doing something. It's just like technically not able to reach it anymore. <laughs> and, yeah. and so there is there is arguments for, for some of that to think if, if that's relevant. And we all already see that in reality because of latency reasons and technical reasons. Most of the data is already in Europe anyways, physically. 
um, it's then a bit of a question if it still falls under US jurisdiction <laughs> or if we then say, okay, if the data is in Europe, we're European customers, as data from the European Union, maybe the GDPR should be the controlling instrument and not the NSA law. <laughs> and, and that is... Um, Just maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and that is, I think, if you if you zoom out on a very high level, what we have here is a conflict of jurisdictions. And we'll have that much more in the sense that for the 2000s, 2010s maybe, um, there was this feeling of the internet is the wild, wild west, nothing is regulated, everything's fine, everybody can do whatever they want to do. Now that's fine, as long as there is no rules, there is no conflict of law. Now we have the next step where suddenly all the governments start to regulate everything that's online. And if you look at the European Union, we pass a new digital law for something <laughs> um, about every half a year. So, um, and you see China and Russia and the US and everybody else passing laws as well. So what we'll now have to ha we'll now have is a conflict of law situation where simply you're a company and one jurisdiction tells you A and another jurisdiction tells you B. And you'll have to decide which one you want to follow or you split your operations and follow each one of them. And that will probably be the reality for the next 20 or 20 years, because the more it's going to get regulated on a national or like geographically limited level and not on the international level, we will have these conflicts simply. Um, and uh, I think that is good to understand or know for, you know, planning your projects for the next 10 or 20 years, that you may have to choose which side you're going to be on or that you have separate systems that run in different ge geographies. And we already have that with, with China, for example. A lot of people told me, it's yep. like, if you operate in China, yep. the Chinese are serious about their laws. You have to like host it there, do everything there, and follow right, We have rules. a question about that. Yeah. So. And, and that's just the reality of operating in these jurisdictions. Let's switch to the third <laughs> question. <laughs> Stefano Leucci, fellow at Nexa Center. Uh, during the three years without a data transfer agreement between US and EU, the number of sanction issues was out, yes, less than 10. Yep. Considering your experience uh, with NOI been filing several complaints on internet services implying data transfer toward the United States, for example, Google Analytics, what is your perception of data protection authorities' approach to this issue? across Europe? The simple answer is like, can't see it, can't see it, not there, let's pretend it's not here, let's hope something is coming up. Um, and I think it's not just the DPAs, what we have is an overall, in German you call it Mikado, like the, you know, this game where the, all the sticks are there and they're not allowed to move. Yep. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> and, and I think it's called something like that in the rest of, of yeah. uh, Europe, so that's <laughs> so, fine. And we call it usually a Mikado situation where everybody just doesn't move, hoping that someone else starts to move. Um, and that is what we had. Basically, the DPAs were hoping that the European Commission comes up with some new deal. The European Commission was basically hoping for the US to move. For the US to have moved, that would have required enforcement in the European Union. Yep. Then the the, con like the the big tech companies were like, okay, no enforcement, no customers run away, so no problem. Uh, once the customers would have gotten enforcement, they would have run away at some point. Yep. It would have been that pressure. So overall, everybody waited for the other one to take action. Um, and then the end result was that Ursula von der Leyen and, and, um, and um, Biden had an afternoon coffee in Brussels at some point and said, oh, we just do a new deal. <laughs> and, um, and as far as I understand, even the people that negotiated these deals um, know that this is not going to hold up. Um, but it's a political decision that that's now what we're doing. <laughs> and for as long as the new deal is going to be there, that is going to be the law of the land until it's annulled. What's interesting is that the Court of Justice annuls backwards. It's an ex tunc um, annulment. So all your data transfers, yep. literally since 2000, are yep. basically without a legal basis unless you had the SECs. I think going forward, most companies will use the SEC still, plus maybe the transfer, um, I forgot how the new deal is even called, um, TATPF, I know is the, is the acronym, um, plus the new deal. And uh, we'll just basically wait and see as well. I think what's interesting also is to think if you, for example, have a new setup, if you change anything in your setup anyways, to really consider if all of this drama is worth it, in a sense of if, if I pay, I don't know, 5% more on hosting in Europe, but I save 10% on my legal department, <laughs> and then I still make some money and not have this shit going on. Um, so I think that is also a, a factor that people gradually realize that this is not going to be solved anytime soon. And you're basically like jumping from one thing to the next, hoping that it's not going to go under. Um, I don't think it's worth it necessarily. Um, I can tell us our own setup. We started obviously with a setup from in Europe from the get-go with our organization. 
Um, and as a nonprofit, you also have a good amount of data of people. And my compliance was simple. It was one email to saying, oh, you really don't have any subprocessors? They're like, no, we really don't have any subprocessors. Thank you. And that was it. Um, and um, and I think there there's some beauty in that as well to not try to kind of, you know, get on the fringes of the law and try to argue it somehow, um, but to instead just say, okay, why? Don't I host it just there and be done with it? Um, which depends on the system that you're running and what you need and your yeah, requirements. That's not possible for everybody. Uh, but to be honest, for a lot of the standard stuff, it is possible by now. And it's a sort of the standard that is going to be followed because right now y you have the ability, even if you are if you are in a multi-tenancy hosting, uh, yeah. most of the companies. Uh, large enough to be interested uh, in any kind of litigation uh, mm. already use uh, that kind of services that allow for mm. different hosting in different countries and, right and the now. smaller ones oftentimes just i mean i can tell you for us a lot of the stuff that we do is open source standard software yep. that you install with a click of a button on server a or b and you can move it overnight and it's there and i'm done with it and um, so it's also i think interesting and that is not my expertise but what i see is that there is this feeling of we have to do everything in these two providers or three providers as if there wouldn't be a hundred others yeah. and um, my kind of for myself the the one where i really struggled to find someone was a newsletter like email newsletter yeah. because it needs to be servers that are set up well otherwise all your newsletters go yeah. to spam blah 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 but all of them use tracking like fuck like they, all these newsletters are tracked like crazy and you can't turn it off and as a privacy ngo really hard to send out a newsletter that has <laughs> tracking in it I, um, so, I feel you. Um, so we found actually a local austrian provider that does all of that to be honest their interface looks like from the 90s but it works but the fun thing is we wanted to have an import function for example i yep. emailed them and the, the head of the company is emailing back. It's like, hey, that's a good idea. We implement it. Next day, I had an API that did that. I was like, okay, you don't get that at Google. <laughs> and, um, and I think that there is a bit of, of that partly as well to kind of try around and, and, and look at it. What's a bit missing, I think, is also from the industry side, good, um, you know, good comparisons, good like alternatives. Like I think a lot of people just struggle to find a list of alternatives that, that they feel comfortable with and that they know work as well. Because we also have to be honest, like a lot of the stuff is not working well. And so there is there is some feeling of let's go with the big guy because we know it's working. Um, and and that may be a bit of an issue yeah, here as well. Yeah, even doing simple things, uh, very good uh, and very in with uh, a lot of rely and reliab mm. re reliability. It's not yeah. as easy as... Uh, Many would would think, yeah, I can understand for for uh, newsletters because n normally speaking, uh, right now newsletters uh, are made for be tracked. Yeah. So the normal the normal um, <laughs> the, the normal funnel you use yeah. is uh, uh, giving until up. you realize that actually newsletter tracking is not working because yeah. I then looked into it and was like, I okay, was <laughs> so. I think what has like Google opens all the emails automatically, yeah. so you get a hundred percent open rate on Gmail because apparently they do that on like I think it was Gmail, but one of them. And uh, then Microsoft, Outlook, Microsoft too. If you have yeah, got and then uh, Outlook blocks everything, yeah. so even people read it, you see them not as being read. It was like it's actually one of the n most non-workable <laughs> tracking things, anyways. Plus, as a privacy NGO, the discussion ends quickly because you realize that. 90% of your followers yep. have every blocker installed that exists. Yep. So all your numbers are wrong anyways. <laughs> Nine so. out of 10 and the 10th one will just make a fuss for each and every Exactly. Time. So we like, just gave up on it. <laughs> and yeah. Well, I, 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 I'm, not, uh, I'm not telling you he wouldn't be right in making a fuss, but yeah. he will do. And Next question. Us, it's a bit like we see how many link clicks we have. That, yeah. That's oh, the that's definite it. metric. Yeah. And, and I know how, how many link back you yeah, got. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's it. So, Oh, Gabriele Fagioli, CEO at Digital360. Uh, do you think that the actual data transfer agreement between US is stable? And if not, uh, it will ever be possible to reach a stable <laughs> data transfer agreement and uh, how? Yeah. You <laughs> sort of uh, <laughs> talked about that, but it's yeah, easy. Yeah, so um, maybe to, to kind of um, take a second here because it's something that a lot of people are really interested in. So for the new transfer agreement, you have a couple of elements why it's not going to work. Um, first of all, on the commercial side of data usage, um, the Court of Justice requires that it's essentially equivalent. Now, if you look at the privacy um, shield principles that are now the, trend, the new principles again, they're exactly the same wording as before. And if you look, for example, you would need a legal basis under 618, uh, 61 to, 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 to process data. So typically consent or, or one of the other six. Um, 
And what's interesting is that the new deal doesn't even require that. So the new deal only can, basically says any recipient can use the data as much as they want. Um, and you only are able to opt out in two very specific situations. So as a customer, you would know have to know that sub 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 processor received your data, which you usually don't know. Then you would have to go to that website and then find some link where you can find, somehow opt out of them sharing the data further. Not gonna happen. You just have to kind of put that next to Article Six One and say that's not essentially equivalent. And you can do the same thing with most other principles of the GDPR. So already on the commercial side of this system, this is pro this is, has to break. There is just the difference is too extreme. Now on the government surveillance side, there is um, the European Commission is very good in doing PR around that is that they say, oh, there is a new executive order. Wonderful, the new executive order. Sorry, I shouldn't and be laughing, but yeah, I can see the irony. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting because even if you looked at the Privacy Shield, um, they back then said that the US, it was a, a marvelous wording, that the US um, confirmed that there is no mass surveillance or, or, or told them that. It didn't say that the commission confirmed it, but the US government told them that everything is fine, so to say. It's a bit like China telling you everything is fine on mass surveillance in China and the commission just writing that into a decision because if China says fundamental rights are great in China, then they have to be great. <laughs> that's kind of like the approach that we're taking here. Um, and that's again the one we do here. Now with the new executive order, what's interesting is that it's presented as if there wouldn't have been an executive order before. Actually, there was PPD 28, which was the Obama executive order. Yeah. And now you have to put these two side by side and compare them. And you realize that almost everything in the new executive order is also in the old one. And the Court of Justice already looked at the old one and said, no, 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 not good enough. Um, so on that side, um, there is a couple of um, things that even got worse. So, for example, in the old executive order, there were six legal bases for mass processing or for mass um, surveillance. Um, in the new one, it's eight. We have two more. Now it's also for combating climate change. Apparently, you can mass surveil the whole world for climate change. And the other one was for um, for pandemics, which is basically Corona uh, law. Yeah. But um, then you wonder if that is proportionate and so on. Anyways, now talking about proportionality, one of the big new things, and that would have been mind blowing if it would be true, is that the new executive order says that the surveillance by the US has to be proportionate. Now, proportionality is usually what we have in the Charter yep. that the Court of Justice tested and said the US surveillance is not proportionate. Now, the interesting thing is that the Court of Justice said FISA 702 is not proportionate. The new executive order says surveillance has to be proportionate. And they say, however, that they still continue the, the surveillance exactly as it was before. Now, these three things cannot be true at the same time. Yep. And the magic trick is that the US used the word proportionality as in the European Union but gives an American meaning to it. Yeah. So it's like we have a European scale that goes from here to there of proportionality, and then we have an American scale that is somewhere outside of that. And Americans can still say, oh, we're proportionate under our definition, even though we're not proportionate on the European definition. Now, that can only be the dream of some some bureaucrat or, or diplomacy guy or whatever that basically just tries but to get it's some... It's damn genius. Yeah. You have to concede that yeah. it is it's, damn it, genius. Yeah, it's just like, yeah, it's a pocket player trick, basically, to say we use the same word, but then have a different definition of it. Um, and uh, that is fundamentally the, the big change there. And imagine you're at the court of justice. Imagine you're one of the judges that already told them to fuck off with the old deal. <laughs> and now they're telling you, but there is an American proportionality. How about that? And, and I mean, it's going to be so I would obvious. Be pissed off uh, the, uh, about yeah. the largest scale, and, scale and, possible. And that is really one of the issues. It's going to become a matter of the authority of the court of justice as well. If, if you're the Supreme yeah. Court of the European Union and tell them twice, this is not doable and they come back with the same shit just with a new label on it, they will test that even more than before. And they have to because it's really, um, it becomes really a rule of law issue of, of uh, you know, do we have a court of justice that ultimately is the arbitrator about fundamental rights? Or is the commission simply free to just pass it so often that everybody gets bored and then just walks away? Um, and I mean, it's may maybe a very Austrian version of thinking about that. We had this right wing um, populist in the 90s. We had all of that. 20 years before the rest of Europe or 10 years before the rest of Europe. Um, and we have in the south of Austria, it's a bilingual area. So the street signs would have yep. to be bilingual, but no one knew what the percentages of when it has to be bilingual or not wasn't defined. So one lawyer kind of brought a case and it went all the way to, Supreme, uh, to the Supreme Court, the constitutional court, and they said it has to be bilingual. Now that politician, instead of making a bilingual sign, took the sign, 
in front of all the media yep. and concreted it back in five meters down the road and said, oh, it's a new sign, so the law, the judgment does not apply. And this is literally what the European Commission is doing here. It's just like, oh, it's a new deal. And, and so, you know, and, and at some point it's going to be really interesting if at some if 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 the judges are just gonna get even more and more and more aggressive on that because um it's really a matter of of, of authority and constitutional fabric of the european union um that we see here and and that may be um another factor that probably the privacy community doesn't think that much about but in the larger european union uh fundamental rights or and, and constitutional doctrine that's really important that the Court of Justice also just doesn't back down and say, okay, just pass it five yeah. times and the fifth time we're just going to look the other way. I would I would say that it's a reputational problem about the court itself because if yeah. it's so easy, yeah. so easy to circumvent uh, mm -hmm. every, every kind of pronunciation, well, that is a problem. And that is already easy because of timing. So the Court of Justice usually takes a couple of years until they can annul something. And the, the commission theoretically is very quick in passing things. In reality, it takes very long yeah. as well. Um, but it's kind of like that they can outpace the court of justice, yep. so to say. Um, so one thing that we'd like to apply for as well, which would be novel and I don't like it has a 10% chance to actually work, uh, would uh, be for the court of justice to um, pause the application of the new deal for the time it's being reviewed. That yep. would take one and a half years out of the process. Um, so that for the meantime, they would say, okay, this, we have already decided twice that it doesn't work. Looks like it's very much the same. It's millions of people's data that goes to the US yep. and we already said that's a violation of fundamental rights. So we pause the application of the new deal for the time being. Very unlikely to happen, um, but it would be one option for the court of justice to go ahead, come, become ahead of this kind of game yeah. and, and turn the dynamics a bit. Um, and that would be one of the hopes that it's just going to be a message to say, OK, we're not going to be fucked around with this anymore. Yeah. Um, again, not likely, but it would be interesting. I wouldn't bet on it. On Mine that. either. My, my money is on the other side. <laughs> okay. But we would still make the application just because the Court yeah. of Justice can only decide about it once there is an application. Yeah, and then... They, Worth the they try, will, wouldn't bet on it. It's a free page already to argue, um, and and it would give them the option to go ahead on that. Yeah. Okay, Alessandro Ortalda, uh, MD of the Brussels Privacy Hub, that, that wrote you, and you didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Currently, the predominant focus uh, from society and you, looking at your involvement with Schrems One and two cases, has centered on data transfer challenges between United States mm. and the European Union. Do you see similar issues with other jurisdictions, legal system, or countries? <laughs> um, similar, not necessarily. Um, there is the U.S. is definitely. I mean, it's a democracy. There is rule of law. In my view, the U.S. system has a lot of problems just because it's very ancient and wasn't updated in many ways. Um, but that's largely historic, and we're probably culturally not too far off. Um, the big difference with the U.S. is that our data is factually there. So we oftentimes have to think about how about China and Russia and so on. We literally at Noib, I mean, we run more than 800 cases. We literally, I think, other than TikTok, never had any serious China issue in any of the software stack that we looked into. Okay. Um, so from a from a factual perspective, the US is the one big player that we're talking about here. Um, and that is the reason why we also focus on that. Um, if tomorrow all of Europe would suddenly decide, hey, we're hosting in China, which, by the way, for good reasons, no one does, <laughs> and, um, is, uh, we would probably have to look into that as well. Yeah. Um, but right now, the, the, we don't have a jurisdiction that has similar breadth of surveillance laws and similar possibility to actually do surveillance in the sense of Sweden has very broad surveillance laws. Um, partly France has very broad surveillance laws, Germany a bit. Um, but most of our data is actually not in these jurisdictions. Um, so we usually, because we're limited and we're based on donations, like we just run on donations. You're using the Pareto um, strategy. We're basically looking at what is the biggest issue yeah. to look Pareto into. Pareto strategy, 20% exactly. of the effort, 80% yeah. of exactly, the data. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's the reason we focus on that. Um, one topic that came up a bit and that would be interesting is the UK because now there are... Um, I was thinking about yeah. that. And there is a bit of a, um, to be honest, on my side, a bit of like, this is such a fucked up topic with the whole Brexit that I didn't want to like add fuel to the fire. <laughs> um, but now gradually, I mean, we're, we're now reestablishing these relationships and, and have to define them anew. 
And it is interesting because the US does have, uh, the UK does have very broad surveillance laws as well. And under what's a bit weird is under EU law, the national security of member states is exempt from the jurisdiction of the European Union. Yeah. So the Court of Justice cannot actually, I mean, there is discussions and there is ways maybe um, that the, the Court of Justice cannot that easily, let's put it that way, um, have jurisdiction over the national security of Germany yeah. or France. Um, but it would have a lot of options. Like it does have full jurisdiction over third countries because that's they don't fall under exemption. Um, so the UK would suddenly get into the jurisdiction of the of the Court of Justice for sure. Um, what's a bit different with the UK is that they still have Article Eight of the Charter, so they're still part so long. Yeah. Let's see what they do on that. For the, uh, time, for the time being. They would still fall on the Strasbourg jurisdiction, so there's a bit of a baseline guarantee. The big problem with the Strasbourg um, and Court of, and, and Strasbourg and Luxembourg um, situation here is that Strasbourg is very permissive when it comes to government surveillance. If you look at the case law, they're like, oh, you go do whatever you yeah. want to do. Um, and once, I can understand their reasons. So. Yeah, yeah, it's a broader, it's also a broader jurisdiction yeah. and has different history. Luxembourg is very much on the other side of the courts, even if you compare to national courts, the Luxembourg um, Court of Justice uh, rules are usually very strong. Um, also, if you look at European surveillance, like data retention or something like that, where they were much more outspoken than than many of the national courts are. Um, so for us, it's always interesting to get into the jurisdiction of Luxembourg uh, because that's the one that actually looks at stuff. Next question. <laughs> oh, Gabriele Rizzo. <laughs> what critical issue do you see arising from the tension between data transfer being strongly constrained by norms mm. and, uh, and regulation and being liberalized by market pressure? Yeah, it's a question of do you have rule of law or not, I think, to a certain extent. Um, and we can, theoretically, we can change the laws. Um, to do that, we would, um, I think what's important to stress is all of that is not done just under the GDPR. Mm -hmm. the, um, our, uh, like our cases are basically done based on the charter rights. Um, and there's logic to it in the sense if you can only guarantee these charter rights if you make sure the data is here because once it leaves your jurisdiction, there is no protection anymore. So in reality, ever since the 90s, we have kind of an export control of data in the European Union, which is a very, we don't have export control on many yep. things like that is a very strict rule. At the same time, if you look at, for example, other import laws, I mean, we debated about having a US uh, deal with the US on chlorinated chicken or not. And I'm not sure if chlorinated chicken is that important really versus all your data okay. going to the US. Um, but with well, it is important. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, there is, if you see at other trade negotiations, it's very normal that we say, okay, that's not the same. We don't have a deal here. And it's interesting that here it's a bit like it grew first and then the law gets applied. So there is just a lot of this wild, wild west still. And that is partly this market pressure of we've always done it. It's already there. Um, I think in the rule of law situation, you have to make sure that the rule gradually gets applied and, and moves forward. Um, you could change the law. I mean, we, would have, we can change the Charter of Fundamental Rights. We just need all the member states to agree unanimously <laughs> that we change it. Um, so I don't think that's going to be realistic from a very just practical point of view. So the reality is we'll need to really work. Um, I think if we want to have uh, practical solutions, first one is um, international agreements among democratic countries. That may take a while. In the meantime, to get at least the big tech providers to limit access from the US, that's doable. Um, you could have a separate entity in Europe that holds the data and then you would actually fall outside of the US jurisdiction as far as we know. Um, just hosting the data in Europe is not enough. Like really there has to be no yeah. physical access from the US anymore. That is also doable. Um, and we see gradually that companies move towards that. I mean, they still oversell it. They say, oh, it's a European cloud and in yeah. reality there's still some access. But you see that gradually it moves towards that. So. And they use cryptography uh, yeah. in, in a very much more consistent way. Yeah. And, and in, in a provable way. The problem is that yep. most of the stuff that we see right now, also these su uh, supplementary measures that yep. were uh, put out there, are laughable. Like they just like are 30 pages of bullshit. Uh, my favorite supplementary measure that Google, for example, had on this list is that they said, oh, we put a, a fence around our data center and the sign saying, do not enter. That's going to deter the NSA, I'm sure. <laughs> and and um, so what I think we really have to have more of a discussion is technically, and that's the reason also to, to probably mention, um, the supplementary measures were only brought up in our in our submission to the Court of Justice. No one else talked about it. Okay. We said if there's a technical solution, fine, especially because we wanted to tackle the issue of international data transfers going through a country. So yep. if you have an end-to-end -end encryption, the US is in the middle, mm -hmm. and from the metadata you can't really tell where anything is going, what's the problem? Yeah. Um, so for that we wanted to make sure that there are solutions. 
Now, what we see in all of that, and you sometimes, you know, as a as a lawyer, you wonder if you should have made that argument because you wanted to be fair and wanted to do. We usually have a very academic approach to that to say, fair enough, that's that's within the law, that's not, you know. Um, and we tried to put that in, and what we realized is that the legal industry, so to say, so the big yep. tech law firms and so on, saw that little line in the judgment in the end and tried to fly a jumbo jet for this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's just like, this is just an exemption for, for various little situations. And um, so I think there could probably be innovative solutions to that. You're supposed if, to if, be a lawyer. You yeah. should know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what, what's happening. <laughs> yeah. Um, sometimes you're still believing in the good in the world. <laughs> and, um, no, and, and so it's, it's a bit the situation that um, there could be proper solutions and could be proper ways to, to solve that. We just don't see in reality that a lot of the companies actually do that. They use that and just produce 50 pages of bullshit. Um, to just give it to their customers and say, oh, there's 50 pages of bullshit, don't read it um, and don't think about it, but you know, take that paper and say everything's fine. And everybody wanted that. Everybody's happy to say, oh, Microsoft tells me it's fine. And I had a conversation with one of them a while ago and said, um, actually with a big customer said, ask them to put it in a contract that they are liable for all the costs if that is not legal after all. Turns out none of the companies would have a clause in that. They just say, Don't oh, it's illegal. <laughs> and yeah. And I was like, if you're that convinced that this is illegal, put it in a fucking contract and be liable for it. Um, and the answer is usually no. <laughs> so that is a bit painful. Painfully pain surprised. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, once you put them to the test, you realize that a lot of that is just blah, blah, and bullshit. And, and um, yeah, but it still works. People increasingly love bullshit and just blah, blah. Um, and that's a bit the bubble that we're in as well. Uh, the other thing that I see a lot in, in our line of work is uh, the customer telling you, well, but we have a European residency mm. of our data. Yeah. That is enough. Yeah. So that's actually a really interesting selling point yeah. um, that they put forward. And I think it's, it's worth expanding on that for a second. So as far as I know, and I'm not an expert on U.S. law, but I by now have to be kind of what my colleagues that really know best yeah. about U.S. law tell me is that FISA 702 does not have geographic limitation. That is for sure. It just doesn't have that. Um, typically, the interpretation on the U.S. side was that you have to provide the data if you have excess possession or control of the data. So if you have some factual um, custody possession or control, so if you have some factual access to it. Same thing in Austria I can tell you, like if, if an Austrian bank has its server in India, you still have to provide the data to the police if they yeah. ask for it. But if you can't access it, you simply can't give it to the police, done. Yep. So we're getting back to the question of factual access. And I think that could be a solution for a lot of these situations that once there wouldn't be any factual access anymore, you could actually host a data in Europe. But that's not about just geography, but that's about really having access from the US. There was a solution that Microsoft proposed in Germany that was kind of the idea that the actual hosting is going to be outsourced to a German provider, yep. that they still sell the product and do all that yep. kind of stuff. Um, but that the f physical location of the data and the actual access to the data is not done by Microsoft anyway anymore. And, that and then way, the employees do not have, yeah, I exactly. saw that uh, the same uh, And that could part. work. That could be an interesting solution. You could even go a bit further. Um, I don't know about Italy in detail, but um, in most jurisdictions, I guess, if you're a stock company, even if you're 100% owner, you don't have a right to direct the director yeah. as the owner. So that could be a way to say, okay, I have a you know, European director that is bound by European law. I'm still the owner 100%, but I cannot direct that guy. Any, uh, and if I would have a direction, that guy would have yeah, to you, say... Um, this you is, can place uh, exemptions on the, on the direction uh, he has to follow. Yeah, yeah. not even there. The, that guy would have to say, um, you know, that it's illegal. It's I'm illegal not allowed on to my do point that. Of view. Yeah, of so course. you can give me all these directions, but I'm not allowed to break the law in Europe. Yep. I'm done here. And that could be a way that you host data in Europe and still have the possibility in the US to argue, I don't have possession custody control. Now, if the US, what the NSA reaction is going to be to that would be interesting in itself. But yeah. that could be a way forward in the meantime to, to have some security here and some, some certainty. Um, and if you back that up with, let's say, technical, um, you know, technical options where you can really prove that technically as well that it factually happens, that would be really interesting. And there is discussions in that direction. Once you talk to the big tech companies, at least in my experience, they all say, yes, doable. But to be honest, our customers are not running away and that would cost a lot of money. So our management is simply not not there for it. Um, and, and that is a bit where we see that simply the pressure is not on. It's not yeah. strong enough. And all this shit suddenly works in China for whatever reason. 
Uh, but for Europe, no, 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 no can't do it. <laughs> now, I, I may be wrong, but I think that that kind of solution is the same that TikTok uh, uh, used by running uh, Oracle based, I think, uh, data uh, centers mm. in the United States without any kind of uh, yeah. employers, uh, yeah. um, with, without any kind of foreign uh, person to have access to that one. And yeah, I, I think mm. it's, well, it has to be worked out, uh, upon, it has to be proven, it has mm. be, to be without doubt, done, but mm. it could be feasible in yeah. my point I mean, of view. I don't know about the uh, specific ta- uh, setup of, of, of yeah, TikTok. I can just say in too. general that's doable as far as I understand. And it's, uh, I think, second best solution. First best solution is fix the law. Yeah. Second best is react properly. <laughs> yeah. And and that could be, for the meantime, an option to to, to segregate in that sense. Um, yeah, because the third, uh, third option, having a totally different uh, uh, company identity yeah. and adapt that could be a little bit tricky to, yeah, to implement. Yeah, absolutely. It and, could be. And I think it's also important to stress because in the US there is a lot of these false narratives that come. It's like that Europe only does that for protectionist reasons. Yeah. Like, yeah, the Court of Justice is really interested in protectionism. <laughs> and that's really the first thing that the Court of Justice yeah. does. And the Commission is not, and they are now fighting. It's just totally crazy. Um, but um, to also, you know, the more you have reasonable solutions and reasonable ways of doing this, the harder it gets to criticize these things, the harder it gets to say, ah, all not doable. Um, so I think that's that's an interest to find solution there as well. Solutions, plural. I promised you to to steal just an hour of your time, and I <laughs> I, I will stick to that promise. I've I've, I've got one last uh, uh, question, and and that is from me. So mm. uh, all the other questions were very informed. Uh, very, <laughs> and I, I'm just a, a, a bastard talking to you, <laughs> uh, uh, but I have to do that. But before asking you the question, please take in account that I'm asking you. But it's the same kind of question that uh, every activist mm. dealing with privacy has uh, had mm-hmm. in p- m- more and more times during yeah. uh, his or her life. So the question is quite simple and is uh, some experts consider disgraceful the so-called privacy mm. weaponization. And, and I've, and I've mm. heard about you yeah. and uh, using privacy weaponization, etc. Mm. Do you think you are weaponizing uh, privacy? Um, I think uh, there's a lot of these narratives that go around and we have that, especially at the office as well, that we're, um, what is it, privacy Taliban, privacy yeah. Nazis. Um, here, here in Italy, we, it's uh, normally privacy Taliban. Yeah, 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 we're like, what? Uh, so some of that you really wonder how aggressive people can get because like, have you read a bit of history yeah. to compare, you know, a, a fundamental right to privacy with what the Nazis did? Um, yeah. you know, um, <laughs> um, so some of that is 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 quite. Amazing. I wouldn't think and, at, uh, <laughs> at the Nazis uh, as the first instance of uh, human rights. Uh, I yeah, wouldn't but think, like, uh, especially if you're German speaking and you upset someone, you're quickly a Nazi. <laughs> that is a truth yeah. as well. Um, so uh, to 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 de- deconstruct that a bit, I think. Um, I mean, obviously we're. What we're doing pisses off people and is really for certain business models their death and for good reasons i mean it's like if you're the police you're death to drug trafficking that's your job to a certain extent and you're not going to be liked by them but that's, that's still your that's job a strong, <laughs> and, that's a strong point of view and, but i can see what you mean yes i mean if, if simply there is companies that yep. simply absolutely have an illegal business model yep. under the gpr i'm absolutely un- understandable that they don't like us and that's fine <laughs> on the <laughs> advertising uh, uh, yeah <laughs> And, and there is advertising that is legal, but if, yeah, for example, course. you're a data broker and all your thing yeah. is I capture data from someone and sell it on to someone else without ever asking consent from anybody. Yeah. And I do elaboration on that and I create personal exactly. profiles. Like, yeah. You know that you're probably on a bit of a dying ship. There. Yeah. Um, so back to the weaponization specifically, um, the word impl- uh, implies that you're using privacy for something else because a weapon is usually a tool to kill someone for some other reason. And that is a narrative that comes up a, a lot as well in the sense that uh, privacy is used to, you know, kill people from the market that are more innovative and, and there's a lot of that. And I think generally we we have to like really sit back with a lot of these things and, and really think about it more and, and be a bit more reasonable about it. Typically with this innovation narrative that oftentimes comes with the, the weaponization. Um, it's interesting how they capture the idea of, of innovation to always be use more data for more shit as if that would be innovative. It, it's a bit like, you know, use more electricity, that's innovative, you know? Um, sometimes it may be innovative to use less electricity and more efficiently yeah, and, you know, and, and more safely and so on. So I think we, with a lot of these narratives, um, we really have to first 
hollow them out and think, do they have a core that makes sense or not? To be honest, a lot of them, are, in my view, at least don't. And then we have to think of what they really try to say. And um, I usually say, you know, it's very innovative to have a product that is not privacy invasive and still delivers the service. That is, in my view, more thinking and making stuff better and innovation in that sense than just hol you know, holding more and more and more data that you don't even know what you're doing with. So I think um, that's really interesting, especially in this discussion, because it's a very technical discussion. It's very hard to understand what's yeah. really happening, especially for lawyers. Lawyers yep. are used to know everything, but I see that even in, in, in our bubble. Once they have to look at code, they have no fucking clue what this machine is doing, but are still judging it. I know it. several <laughs> of them uh, that knows about this stuff. Yeah, but but there, is a, yep. like, there is a very big bulk of people yep. that um, don't know how to code, don't know how to read code. Especially as a lawyer, if you don't know the facts, it's really hard to judge them. <laughs> um, so we're still, and, and also for the general public, it's, it's, it's very hard to understand all of that. And legitimately so. I think also the general public does not have to understand all of that. Um, there are experts, and that's probably the role also of many people watching this video, of making sure that the average show can go home at night after working for the whole day and just use an app or do something without having to worry yeah. about it all. And I oftentimes see as privacy a bit like, um, you know, technical safety standards. Uh, we just go into a house and assume in a developed society yep. that houses do not collapse unless there's an earthquake or something crazy, yep. you know? But generally you assume yep. someone checked the house and someone made sure it's safe. Or that you go on a train and you go with 300 kilometers yep. an hour and someone checked that this train is not falling apart. It's not your job. Yep. I think that is a bit where I see privacy is a bit in that direction to say, if we get that, and we're at the very beginning of it, if we get it to developed level, the average Joe should be able to use it, use software, be able to trust it all. Um, and not have to worry about it anymore. So I'm, I'm also a big fan of not trying to solve this issue with the average user has to be educated and understand it all. No one has ever understood yeah. all of this. I don't fully understand it. Um, so we, we'd rather, I think, have to go towards a situation where we have proper enforcement by the authorities, well-trained people within the companies that say, guys, this is not possible, yeah. we can't do that, um, and get to a very stable solution around that. And that is going to be a very big effort. And I think also what's important to think about it, we had the very beginning of the digital transformation, if you look at it. If you look at like the Industrial Revolution, even 150 years later, we're still fighting about how far do consumer rights go yeah. and workers' rights and so on. That's that's going to be an ongoing debate. And we're at the very beginning. So I usually say the GDPR is probably the least stupid law we have so far. But in 20 years, we're going to look back and say, yeah. oh, we didn't see these five things coming. Um, do we really do that? Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that's also fair to say, you know, we're, we're you know, we don't, especially as an activist, you want to have all the solutions yesterday. <laughs> yeah. But you also have to be realistic that this is going to be gradually going to move that way. And I think it's important for everybody in the bubble to work work towards that. And that's a bit my worry with the GDPR after five years is that it has lost a bit the fear of we have to do something, especially because of the lack of enforcement, um, that there is a bit of the feeling of, yeah, let's just do it with the old directive. Let's just pretend and have yeah. some privacy policy and not take care. And, and we have to work really strongly on that not being the truth, because um, I think it's also a matter of trust and also a matter of democracy. I think it's oftentimes important to stress that the GDPR had more than 90% approval in the European Parliament, yeah. which, I mean, get 90% approval yeah. of anything in a parliament, plus all the member states voted for yeah. it, other than Austria, because we thought it's not strict enough. Yeah. <laughs> but it has a very strong democratic and political yeah. backing. And now, especially the people in the industry and that work with it, talking it down every day, is to me also a bit of a disrespect for the democratic process and the rule of law. Um, because obviously 90, 99% of the people working with it are on the other side of the game. That's the reality. Um, but we also, I think, need to respect that there is a majority view on that. There, If you have polling, you see that people want to have privacy. Um, so it's not something that some bureaucrats in Brussels came up with and pulled out of their ass out of nothing. Um, it is a serious uh, topic. It is a fundamental right, and we will have to gradually work on it. And that's at the same time as a lawyer, for me, one of the most, the reasons why it's the most interesting, one of the most interesting areas it's because it's a fundamental right on the one yeah. hand, but there is so much non-compliance. Yeah. So that the delta is huge in this area. Yeah. So as a lawyer, there's a lot of work to do to get the delta yeah. a bit closer together. So, <laughs> pride, regrets, uh, would, would you have done the same thing over again, looking um, back? 
I, to be honest, uh, I will probably give it a, a big second thought. <laughs> okay. Um, mainly because I like to be in the second row. I like to just do stuff. <laughs> and I absolutely lost my privacy over privacy <laughs> fight, and, which is super weird. Um, I'm sorry, and, Max, you chose the wrong, uh, yeah, absolutely. The wrong and, job before the end. Exactly. That. But, you know, you suddenly have... you do interviews and then people realize that person is someone you can reasonably listen to and you're invited again and so on so you you gradually then then do it up uh, uh, like we like literally into it. say shams one and shams uh, two so I, it's a I, little for, bit for late. a long time i was like the safe harbor ruling the privacy shield ruling no, no way, way i just give <laughs> no up way. um and and it's weird because like people oftentimes think you put yourself there but yeah. you actually like we get i think 10 requests a day and we try to answer two if possible yeah. while obviously the other way around it oftentimes looks like you're pu pushing yourself into everything um and i'm i'm really i'm the person that enjoys much more to really go through the law and and yep. the academic part of this which you don't get to do that much anymore yeah. then and that's that's a bit Sorry. where was there uh, a question that i missed and you There's would always have liked questions no, instead of it, it. you <laughs> would have liked me to to ask no, you I'm, I, think I'm good. <laughs> so since you Thanks have, you, you just told us uh, that uh, you have so many requests, uh, so many, um, so many possibilities. I'm, I'm very, I'm very happy you was uh, you were here. The invite, yeah. So yeah. thank you so much for being here with us today. I hope everyone else uh, there how <laughs> was happy. Just a second in Italian. Se parlate italiano e non avete capito nulla, non preoccupatevi, escono nei prossimi giorni le traduzioni. That is, uh, if you only talk Italian and you yeah. didn't understand anything, we I, will be I translating that. I understood that much that. Italian, that's the good thing. <laughs> and uh, nothing more. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks a lot. And see you next time. See you Ciao. then. Ciao. Bye. L'appuntamento a cui state per partecipare è il primo degli incontri di Privacy for Futures. In risposta a un panorama normativo che è sempre più complesso, a rapide interruzioni tecnologiche e all'assenza di approcci strategici e prospettici alla privacy, Privacy for Future rappresenta un cambiamento fondamentale verso l'apprendimento e lo sviluppo anticipatori nella gestione della privacy. Con l'obiettivo di potenziare i professionisti della privacy e della protezione dei dati, Privacy for Future offre intuizioni preziose sulle metodologie di previsione, dotandoli di strumenti avanzati per navigare e affrontare le sfide emergenti nel dominio in continua evoluzione della privacy. Privacy for Future è una piattaforma di apprendimento interattivo che favorisce un ambiente dinamico in cui i pari si impegnano e imparano gli uni dagli altri, guidati da un focus sulla comprensione, la condivisione e l'anticipazione, rispondendo alle esigenze di evoluzione dell'ecosistema della privacy. Privacy for Future è il risultato di un impegno collaborativo tra tre entità altamente qualificate nel panorama italiano e internazionale. 42 Law Firm e eh, P4i offrono competenze di alto livello e una rete di contatti significativa, mentre Longviews eh, assicura la solidità delle metodologie e dei processi nel campo del foresight e del pensiero futuro. Se volete essere parte di questa nuova avventura, trovate più informazioni a www.privacyforfuture.it. Iniziamo!